Hello, everyone. My name is Connor McKittrick, and I'm a recently graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology last year. And next month, I'll be entering grad school for public policy. I have a younger brother who is 14 years old who, like me, has Usher 1B. I'm glad to be here on this day, and I've been given the distinct pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Shannon Boy, who <clears throat> Shannon Boy uh, graduated with a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Florida in 2006. She is now a tenure full professor and the associate chair or chief of the Division of Molecular and Cellular Therapy in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Florida. The focus of her research is developing viral vector-based gene therapy for the treatment of inherited ocular disease. She has multiple awards and pending pendants uh, emanating from her research program and is actively funded by the NIH, private foundations, and pharma. She is the recipient of several major awards, including the Foundation Fighting Blindness's Board of Directors Award, the Gunn Harrington Scholar Award, the Arvo Foundation Merck Innovative Op <clears throat> Ophthalmology Award, the Arvo Pfizer Carl Cameras a translational research award. Since 2010, she has given over 70 invited lectures, both within and outside the USA. She's also founder, director, and chief scientific officer of Atsanya Therapeutics, a clinical stage gene therapy company based in Durham, North Carolina. Outside of her research, she is actively involved in the teaching mission of the College of Medi Medicine at the University of Florida, and is passionate about outreach education outside of the university. She routinely provides lab tours for visually impaired patients, hosts foundation meetings, and educates patients about ongoing research being conducted to address treatments for their, blind, for their conditions. Please welcome Dr. Boy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to come speak today. I'll admit this is the first time I've gotten on a plane in about two and a half years, so it's nice to get back in the saddle again and to interact with patients that motivate me so much um, and also to see some of my, my favorite colleagues. Um, so I'm here today on behalf of Atsina Therapeutics. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, to discuss our efforts to develop a gene therapy to correct the visual impairment associated with Usher syndrome 1B. If I talk too fast, someone just yell at me, please, by all means. Okay, so the specific form of Usher syndrome that my lab and now Atsina Therapeutics is focused on is caused by mutations in the myosin 7A gene, which we've heard a little bit about today. Um, and this is one of the more severe forms of Usher syndrome and it's inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. And as Jen mentioned earlier, that means you need to inherit one mutated copy of myosin 7A from mom and one mutated myosin 7A copy from dad. So this accounts for about 50% of cases of all adult deaf blindness. But as Jen mentioned earlier, patients with USH1B tend to be born profoundly deaf, have vestibular defects, and begin to progressively lose vision within the first decade. And as I mentioned, this is associated with mutations in the myosin 7A gene. So what cell type is to blame in Usher syndrome 1B? Um, well, a lot of the work that we've done in my lab and others around the world have done, and now that we're doing it at Sina, implicates photoreceptors as the problem in Usher 1B, as in other many, many other forms of Usher syndrome. 
What you're looking at on this slide is a cross section of the human eyeball on the left. And at the very back of that eye is a very thin tissue. Despite its small size, it's quite mighty. Um, there are a lot of neuronal cell layers in the retina that perform a lot of really important functions. And all the way at the back of the retina are the photoreceptor cells, your rods and your cones. And those are the cells responsible for converting a photon of light into an electrochemical signal that's sent to your brain and processed there as vision. So when the myosin 7A gene is mutated, what happens is there's a misspelling in the gene. And as a result, it can't make the protein that it's supposed to make. Or it makes a protein, but it's got a really funky shape and it can't do its job properly. So myosin 7A is mutated, it can't make the right protein, and then when the photoreceptors don't have that myosin 7A protein, they become dysfunctional, and eventually they will die off. They're lost structurally. So on this slide, what I'm showing you is a little bit of the natural history of this disease, of H1B. On the right, you can see what are called optical coherence tomography, or OCT scans. And you can think of these like an ultrasound of the retina. Instead of using sounds to generate an image, though, they use light. And what this allows physicians to do is to look at the retinal structure in patients over time and to follow the progression of the disease. So what, what we've done in this image here is color-coded the photoreceptors in shades of blue. And up top is a normal patient's OCT scan. So no disease in this patient. And you can see a very nice um, stretch of photoreceptors across that entire retina, across that entire scan. Whereas the bottom three OCT scans show examples of patients with H1B. And you can see that over time in this disease, you have a loss of retinal structure or a loss of those photoreceptors that starts in the peripheral retina and ultimately encroaches into the central retina until most patients are just left with a central island of photoreceptors in the very middle of the retina, and those are the cone photoreceptors. So because of that loss of the peripheral rod photoreceptors first, rod-mediated vision tends to be lost within the first couple of decades in H1B. But really important is that those central photoreceptors, those cones, can stick around for multiple decades. Patients tend to retain these islands of central cone photoreceptors even into their fourth decade. So the bottom line here, what's really important for us as researchers, as gene therapists, is that if the cells remain, then they can be a target for gene therapy. So we believe that H1B, because of the maintenance of that central island of photoreceptors, that these patients are good candidates for gene therapy. So what is gene therapy? Um, it's super scientific, but we can make it simple, just like Susie just did an excellent job of doing. Um, but basically, it's correcting the underlying genetic defect. So the bottom line is what we're doing is we're taking a healthy copy of myosin 7A, we are delivering it to the photoreceptor cells of these patients. That healthy copy of the myosin 7A gene then goes on to make a normal copy of the myosin 7A protein, and then hopefully that normal protein goes on to restore the function of those cells and ultimately restore vision to those patients. So how do we get the gene into the patient's photoreceptors? Susie's already introduced this a bit. Um, and I have a slightly different, although similar, analogy. Um, I like to call it the taxi cab analogy. So we use a virus called AAV, or adeno-associated virus. And as Susie mentioned, this is a non-pathogenic, perfectly safe virus that's been gutted of all of its native DNA. But really, we're taking advantage of nature, because we know that what viruses do really well is get into our nose, get into our cells, infect them, and then release their genetic information. So we take out all of the bad viral DNA and we replace it with a healthy copy of myosin 7A. We then direct that virus to the photoreceptors, it infects them, and then drops off a healthy copy of myosin 7A. So you can think of AAV, or that virus, as a taxi cab. And you can think of the gene, the myosin 7A gene, as the passenger inside. And I'm sort of the cab driver. I'm directing that cab to the, the destination, in this case the photoreceptors, where um, that gene or that passenger should be dropped off. One limitation of AAV, though, is that it's relatively small. It's a tiny little virus. It's only about 24 nanometers wide. And so that brings us to our problem. 
Houston, we have a problem. I know we're in Austin, but Austin, we have a problem, wouldn't have made sense. <laughs> but the myosin 7a gene is too large to fit inside a standard AAV vector. So there's no way we can jam it in there and overstuff the virus. Um, so we had to come up with an alternative solution. So we've worked for years in my lab, and now we're continuing this work at Atsina to develop a dual AAV vector approach to deliver myosin 7a to the photoreceptors. So it sounds um, difficult, but actually if you boil it down, it's pretty simple. What we do is we take the large myosin 7a gene, we split it in half, we deliver the front half via one AAV and the back half via another AAV. We then co-infect those two AAVs into the same cell. They release their genetic information and via complementary sequence, those two halves find each other and go on to make the full-length myosin 7a gene which then goes on to make the full-length myosin 7a protein and hopefully restore function to the photoreceptor cells. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you all a video um, that Atsina commissioned to sort of uh, visually better depict what I just described. And hopefully it will cooperate and play for me. Oh, we need volume. Mm. Okay. In large genes, dual AAV vectors are used. Adeno-associated viral vectors have a limited packaging capacity and cannot be used to deliver gene constructs larger than 5 kilobases. To address diseases caused by mutations in large genes, dual AAV vectors are used. The coding sequence is split in half, with each half containing a complementary recombinogenic sequence to mediate recognition and recombination. Each half is packaged into a separate AAV vector. Both vectors are co-delivered by subretinal injection to co-infect the same target cells, delivering the front and back half coding sequences. Once both vectors have entered the nucleus and their genetic materials are released, the respected halves of the delivered gene recombine to form the full-length construct that ultimately generates a functional mRNA and produces a full-length therapeutic protein. Okay. All right, so we have been working on these dual vectors for quite a while now, and we have shown that they are successfully able to deliver full-length myosin 7a protein in a variety of settings. This includes in cells in a dish, um, in photoreceptors of the mouse retina, and most recently in the retina of a clinically relevant species, a non-human primate or a monkey. Um, we've shown that we can correct one of the retinal phenotypes. It's sort of a subtle retinal phenotype. Um, but it's correctable nonetheless with these dual vectors in a mouse model of USH1b. Um, we have some unpublished data, but I thought it would be interesting to this audience, even though my main focus is on the eye. But we do show that these dual vectors are capable of correcting vestibular dysfunction in a mouse model of USH1b. So that's not the retina, but it, it gives us additional proof of concept that these dual vectors are effective. And I can't read the rest of my slide, so I'm gonna let you guys read that, and if I miss something, I'll come back to it later. <laughs> it's so small. Okay, so AAV comes in a variety of flavors, um, and each different flavor of AAV or each different type of taxi cab um, is very good at delivering genes to different cell types and different tissue types. So certain AAVs are good at delivering genes to the eye, and certain genes are good at delivering, or certain capsids are good at delivering genes to the muscle, for instance. Um, so AAV is really malleable, and what that means is you can kind of tinker with it and toy with it and make it behave in interesting ways. Um, so at Atsina, we've developed a novel capsid called AAVSPR, and that stands for spread, and you'll understand why we named it SPR in just a moment. But this capsid seems very useful for delivering genes to the retina. So how do we get AAVs to photoreceptors? Well, we use a surgical procedure called subretinal injection. Um, this is a surgery where a needle is placed underneath the retina between the photoreceptors and the RPE, and you can see in the cross-section of this eyeball that it creates a little bleb, so that's where the vector is placed. You're not detaching the whole retina, you're just detaching a little bit of it. 
So in this experiment here, what I'm showing you are pictures of the back of a monkey eye that received two subretinal injection blebs of a first generation AAV vector, so one that we knew about years and years ago, driving just a, a general gene, um, so GFP, green fluorescent protein. So we're not talking myosin 7A yet, we're just talking about AAV delivering a green fluorescent protein. So you can see in the week one image the margins of the subretinal injection blebs. So that's the edge of where the vector was placed in the retina, and that's demarcated with a little yellow line. And over time, you can see that that GFP expression turns on, so that AAV is working, but it's only driving gene expression within the margins of that original subretinal injection bleb. However, our novel um, capsid from uh, Atsina, AAV SPR, has this really unique ability to spread very well beyond the margins of that subretinal injection bleb. So you can see that GFP expression is lighting up the entire retina, and it's not just confined to those original blebs. So when we saw this, we thought, wow, this could be a really unique capsid for delivering myosin 7A to those remaining photoreceptors in the central retina of H1B patients. And the reason that this is exciting to us is if you have a patient with a retina where only a tiny little island of photoreceptors remain, you can understand there would be some hesitation to place a needle right under that very precious remaining island of photoreceptors. So if we have a vector that we can place outside that precious region, but yet it will still deliver a healthy copy of myosin 7A to those cones, then we have a winner. So we asked that question in this experiment here. What you're looking at is a monkey eye that received three subretinal injections of just an AAV GFP, another green fluorescent protein experiment. The central retina of this monkey was not detached during the surgery, and after the monkey was sacrificed, we looked at retinal sections, so we visualized pieces of the retina taken from the central retina or the peripheral retina. So the middle part is, is zone three, if you can see that, and you can see that we had almost 100% of the photoreceptors in that central retina expressing GFP. So again, the central retina was not detached during the surgery, yet we're getting extremely efficient transduction or gene expression in those central photoreceptors. So more recently, we asked the more important question, can we deliver myosin 7A to the central retina of a clinically relevant species using these dual AAV SPR vectors? So this was a six-week study. We looked at two different dual AAV vector platforms, which I won't get into today, um, but we delivered two 75 microliter subretinal blebs to these monkeys. What you can see here is a cross-section of the eyeball, and what we've done after sacrifice is looked at myosin 7A expression within the injection bleb, as well as within the central retina, a region that we refer to as the fovea. And in red, you can see myosin 7A expression, and what you can notice immediately is that there's very robust expression of myosin 7A, both within the injection bleb as well as within the central retina. So we were very excited by this result. And that's the first time that anyone has shown AAV-mediated myosin 7A expression in a monkey retina, so very exciting. The next thing we asked was, how much myosin 7A are we making um, relative to the amount that you see in a normal monkey? So um, with the help of my wonderful former postdoc who's sitting over there, Kate Calibro, um, we did a Western blot to probe for how much myosin 7A was coming from our AAV versus how much was found in the normal retina. And I won't get into kind of how we differentiated that right now, um, but what we saw was super physiological levels of myosin 7A, meaning that our dual AAV vectors are making more myosin 7A than even needs to be present in the normal monkey retina. That's great news from a safety standpoint because it means we can bring our dose down, which is always a, a better alternative in patients. But these dual vectors appear to be very efficient. So in summary, uh, we have identified a novel capsid, AAV SPR, that promotes myosin 7A expression both within the subretinal injection bleb as well as, as within the central foveal uh, retina, which is really the area that we want to target. Um, and, and we can do that without surgically detaching this region of the retina, so that's really good news. Um, we know that we can drive full-length expression of myosin 7A at physiologically relevant levels in a clinically relevant species. We see that it's localized to the photoreceptors, which is the site of its proposed function, and we believe strongly that these dual AAV vectors 
show promise for the treatment of retinitis pigmentosa associated with H1B. So finally, I just want to thank the management team at Atsina Therapeutics, our CEO, Pat Richel, um, my other half and partner in crime, uh, Sanford Boy, who's our CTO, our CMO, Kenji Fujita, and our head of CMC, Mike Kelly. Um, but an extra special thank you to the past and current members of the Boy Lab at the University of Florida, especially Kate, who made this project her baby and was with me for seven years working on this and deserves so much credit for everything that I just showed you. Um, so thank her when you see her in the hallway. <laughs> and also the, uh, the past sponsors of this project, um, including the Foundation Fighting Blindness and the National Eye Institute. And that's just an extra slide. Thank you very much for your attention.